Chris Mikowski for the American Battlefield Trust standing on the banks of the beautiful Rappahannock River in Fredericksburg, Virginia. And we're going to bring you fantastic coverage today for the anniversary. 160 years ago today as the Union Army tried to get across this river and drive the Confederates out of their position, suffering the most devastating loss the Army of the Potomac will suffer throughout the Civil War. We've got all kinds of on-location coverage for you today. We've got Chris White behind the camera right now. He'll be coming on in just a little moment to talk about part of this story. We've got Dan Davis coming in in just a few minutes. We've got Sarah K. Byerly coming in in just a few minutes. We're going to have all kinds of great on-location stuff for you today. I want to urge you to share this on your Facebook page. Share this with your friends. Get people to join in with us today because we've got lots of cool stuff going on. Let me get us up here to the banks of the river because as you know, Ambrose Burnside is someone we think of as, as someone who is not the most brilliant man in the entire Army of the Potomac. Not the sharpest tool in the shed, right? Except that he gets here by stealing a march on Robert E. Lee. He gets over here and knows he's got to get across this river. He wants to take possession of the town and the transportation network that's here. And that'll allow him to move his army on toward Richmond, using the roads, using the railroads, even being able to take advantage of some of the protection that the river might be able to offer him. That's why Fredericksburg itself became such an important hub because of this transportation network that converges here. Burnside gets to the city, wants to take advantage of that, and head south. He pulled the head fake on Robert E. Lee, who was uh, expecting him to continue down around the Orange and Alexandria Railroad. But he gets here, can't get across the river. He knows the bridges are destroyed, and he calls back to Washington to ask for pontoon bridges to get sent here so he can construct bridges across this river. In fact, we're standing at one of the locations where he will eventually build one of those bridges. So, of course, Henry Halleck, General in Chief of the Army, just a fabulously mediocre guy at his job. He's like, oh, yes, pontoon bridges. Yes, I'll get you some. And he doesn't bother to hurry up at all. And so Burnside gets here, and that's just when the orders get to the pontooners, and I wanted to use that word today, pontooners, to finally get into motion. So he's delayed. Robert E. Lee, nobody's fool, understands what's going on, and he's going to react in just a moment. And uh, to come on and talk about that, I'm going to ask Sarah K. Byerly to get Robert E. Lee here to Fredericksburg to counter Ambrose Burnside on the far side of the river. Thanks, Chris. Yes, the Confederates have to come and they're going to attempt to block this Union movement to the south along the railroad, as Chris was um, describing. So Robert E. Lee initially was looking for a different defensive position. He kind of toyed with the idea of going down by the North Anna River. Jefferson Davis did not like that idea. Jefferson Davis being president of the Confederacy, he felt that would be letting the Union Army get a little too close to Richmond. So instead, the first corps of the Army of Northern Virginia, commanded by General James Longstreet, is going to set up a defensive position here around Fredericksburg, particularly on the high ground um, beyond the town. They're going to move into this position, and in mid-November, uh, the Second Corps of the Army of Northern Virginia, commanded by Thomas Jonathan Jackson, better known by his nickname Stonewall, will begin moving from the Shenandoah Valley over to the Fredericksburg area. Lee will join the armies or join the troops here and begin setting up position near Fredericksburg. Now, it's not clear to Robert E. Lee what the Union Army is, will do next. He realizes they're going to have to cross the Rappahannock River, but he doesn't know where in the Fredericksburg area. So when Jackson's Corps arrives, he's going to send Jackson's Corps along the Rappahannock River, about 20 miles to the south, stringing them out all along, the, um, all along that distance in hopes that when the Union Army begins their crossing effort, they will then be able to concentrate the other Confederate forces to that area. So Lee recognizes the Union Army will have to cross the river, but he doesn't know where. And on the morning of December 11th, it's going to start becoming clear. And we'll bring our... Dan, are you up next? I believe I'm up next. Dan Davis is up next to start talking about the crossings. Thank you, Sarah. And good morning, everyone. Is this good? It's going to have to be. <laughs> Thank you. Great, great technical crew here, as always. Now, as Sarah mentioned, Lee's able to concentrate his army on the south bank of the Rappahannock, effectively blocking Ambrose Burnside's route south. So Burnside 
has been blocked here at Fredericksburg. He's got to find a way to get across the Rappahannock, get on the same side of the river as the enemy. So he's going to look upstream. No go. There's a slack water navigation canal above the city, going to make crossing very difficult in that area. He's going to look downstream at Port Royal, as Sarah just mentioned, about 20 miles south of Fredericksburg, south southeast of the city. Once again, a no go. The river widens there dramatically and He's blocked there by Jackson's Corps. So Burnside surmises that his best option uh, available is to cross immediately in front of the city, across, uh, get across the river from Stafford Heights, which you can see behind me, get into the city, drive through the city as quickly as possible, take the heights west of town, take the Telegraph Road, that's his inside track to the Confederate capital at Richmond. Burnside surmises that if he can get across quickly enough, he's going to be able to take Lee by surprise. So on the morning of December the 11th, the pontooniers, as Chris mentioned, are going to begin moving the pontoon boats down from Stafford Heights, and they're going to set up at three separate crossings here at the upper crossing in Fredericksburg down at the city docks which is known as the middle crossing or Fran and the lower crossing or Franklin's crossing which is just below the city now back here in the city itself Robert E. Lee has posted or directed one of his division commanders Lafayette McClaws to post the brigade of Mississippians four regiments from Mississippi commanded by William Barksdale William Barksdale has two objectives on the morning of December the 11th one monitor the enemy moving on the other side of the river and send word back to Lee if there's any type of federal activity. And number two, should the Federals attempt to cross, Barksdale, within reason, is to, de to delay that crossing as long as possible. Now, as we mentioned, the pontooniers, the engineers are going to begin working early on the morning of December the 11th, dragging the pontoon boats down from Stafford Heights and setting up right here behind me uh, that you can see the area that you see down here and across the river from the slope off my right shoulder. This activity is gonna go on for the, for the next few hours. Obviously, Barksdale's Mississippians who are posted up here in the houses, his pickets are going, is going to hear the, that activity where it's gonna go back up through the chain of command. And a little bit before dawn or so, Two cannon shots are going to ring out from the west, Confederate artillery signaling the Army of Northern Virginia that the Federals are indeed crossing and for the Army to concentrate. And a little after 5 a.m., the Mississippians up here on the riverbank are going to open fire on the bridge builders and on the engineers. And they're going to, the bridge builders and engineers are going to run back over to the safety of the North Bank under cover of two New York regiments commanded by a fellow named Samuel Zook. You may be familiar with him. He's going to die at Gettysburg on July 2nd, 1863. Now, Burnside, to cover the engineers and the, and the pontooners, is going to place approximately 147 cannons up on top of Stafford Heights uh, under the direction of Henry Hunt. 147 guns to begin the day, over 180 will end the day. They are to cover the bridge builders and provide suppressing fire should the Confederates offer any type of resistance. And as soon as the engineers get to back to the north bank of the river, the guns open up, the Mississippians take shelter in the houses in, in the basements, the guns fall silent, Mississippians reemerge as the bridge builders come back out onto the pontoon bridge and they open fire again. And this cycles itself through. These events cycle through through the course of the morning and into the early to mid afternoon hours. And by around 2, 2.30 in the afternoon, Burnside has been delayed for the better part of the last eight to nine hours, and he has to look about for another option. He's got to get these bridges built, especially here at the upper crossing. And, how, and he looks to Henry Hunt, how do we do this? And Hunt comes up with a rather ingenious idea. Let's put Union infantry in some of these pontoon boats, row them across the river, drive the Confederates out of the houses here at the upper end of the city and establish a bridgehead so that we can complete the, the construction of the bridge. And for that riverine crossing, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Chris White. Chris? Hey everybody, thanks for watching. We're on YouTube, we're on Facebook. I'm gonna get Chris Bukowski, our cameraman, out of the road here because we are down live along Sophia Street, also known as Water Street at the time of the American Civil War. And we really thank you for watching this. Please share this with your friends, with your family. If I sound terrible, I have a horrible cold right now, so I apologize for, for my voice, but we're gonna bear through it because as we're standing out here today, let's bring it from the 500,000 feet down to the uh, 500 feet. So we have this river crossing taking place here at Fredericksburg. We have Union soldiers who are across the river from us. At the time of the war, this river would have been about 400 feet wide. 
Now, in the early 20th century, the Rappahannock River is uh, dammed up at the Embry Dam, so that's going to uh, narrow the channel. They're also going to try to blast out the channel because it uh, gets a lot of sediment and mud. If you've ever been down here at low tide, you can actually see, uh, and during drought conditions, you can actually at some points walk across the Rappahannock River, which also begs the point, why didn't Burnside just walk across the river here? Well, this is, has to be a military crossing. Remember, we need to cross over men, horses, material, artillery, everything that you bring along with them. So we bring those temporary bridges. We talked about these pontoons a lot. Pontoons are temporary bridges that are going to be placed in the river behind us. They're boats that are going to be placed in the water, turned sideways, and then placed at distances across the river. Across that, you'll start putting planking, and then you have a ready-made bridge using ropes and other things to anchor it down. So as you go down the Rappahannock River from the upper to the middle to the lower crossing site, you will have the, uh, the river widen dramatically from 400 feet down to about 420, down to 440 feet. And then as you go farther and farther down towards the Chesapeake, it will expand to over 1,000 feet wide down to places like Port Royal. So we have to get across the river here. So these, uh, these men, these engineers, these construction workers essentially will come down here, they will go out onto this flat boat and when their boat's about, or they're onto their flat bridge, and when their bridge is about 200 feet into the water, about halfway across the river, that's when William Barksdale begins to fire upon the Federals. This is around 5 to 5.15 5 in the afternoon, or I'm sorry, in the morning. Um, if you read some of the, the, the accounts from the time, uh, their watches are going to be wildly different. One guy thinks they start firing at 3 o'clock, one at 4 o'clock, another's at 5.15. We'll call it about 5.15 because we don't have standardized time like we think of it today. So these pontoneers put those bridges out into the water. They're shot down left and right. Uh, one man said that it took a lot of bravery to go out under these bridges with just planks in your hands and tools and no weapons. But time and again, these pontoneers went out there these engineers. Well, eventually, when, as Dan pointed out, Henry Jackson Hunt comes up with this idea to put men and boats together and cross the river, this is going to be an ingenious idea. We look back on D-Day, um, uh, June 6, 1944. We look at Anzio. We look at the, the uh, high island hopping campaign during World War II. Yeah, those are all great ideas because they have Higgins boats, they have landing craft, everything. Here, we have no specialized training for this. We're coming up with it on the, uh, on the ground. And we're also using boats that aren't designed to carry men across the river. They're meant for, for buoyancy. They're not meant for speed. So these men who are going to come across in this riverfront, it's going to be a just hellacious battle here. So at around 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Norman J. Hall's brigade of the Union 2nd Army Corps are voluntold that they are going to go across the river down here. And down to the riverfront will come the 7th Michigan Infantry, commanded by a guy named Henry Baxter, Lieutenant Colonel Henry Baxter. His Baxter comes down to the riverfront, his 157 men jump into boats, expecting the engineers at this point to help ferry them across the river. Well, as the uh, Wolverines jump into the boats, out of the boats go the engineers. They don't want any of this. So the Michiganders start pushing the boats into the water, and they start to row. Since they're not trained seamen, they're going to start to spin their boats in the water. Some will start floating downstream. Others will slowly plod across this water because the pontoon boats are flat-nosed. They're not meant to go across any piece of water with any sort of speed. They're going to go across, and it's going to be like forcing a crossing here. And once the boats get about halfway out into the river, men are falling left and right. But once they reach that halfway point, we start to see that the Confederate fire slackens. Because where we're standing up here is actually on a plateau. But the Confederates, who are actually across the street from us, where we're going to walk in a moment, can't actually see down into the river. So once the Federals get closer to the enemy, it seems counterintuitive, they're actually safer because the Confederates can't see them. But halfway across the river, Henry Baxter shot through the chest and he tells his men to turn back. His second in command, Thomas Hunt, says, no, keep going forward. And Hunt's men now will land here, they will pour out of the boats, and they will start to go in and around Sophia Street where we are. And they are going to start fighting house by house, street by street. Because what William Barksdale has done, and we're going to take a walk here up into Fredericksburg, what William Barksdale has done is set up what we would consider today a defense in depth. He set up his first line of resistance here, and this is Sophia Street, uh, also called Water Street because it's along the water. Now, he will have men down here from Mississippi, 
Behind Chris Mikowski will be the, the terminus of the northern end of Fredericksburg, and that will be Floridians under the command of David Lang. Keep moving this way, Chris, to get you out of the road. And then inside the houses down here, inside the warehouses, the houses, any place that you could think will be Mississippians. There'll be two to 20 men per building. They'll put up, uh, they'll dig rifle pits behind us. They're actually gonna lay traps. Uh, they will uh, be in a house just up the street from us. And whenever they're inside of uh, the Welford house, uh, some of the Michiganders and some Massachusetts men will come up to a door and they'll see this door is locked and they'll kick it in. And on the other side of the door, Confederates lying in wait. So the Confederates have set up a main line of resistance, a first line of resistance here. Then the next street back we'll walk to here in a moment is Caroline Street. We'll consider that Main Street here in Fredericksburg. That's where a lot of the confectionaries will be. There's 13 confectionaries here in Fredericksburg. They have a pretty big sweet tooth. Gaslight streets, um, sidewalks, everything. It's a pretty nice city as it's growing up here in the 1860s, a city of about 5,040 people. But then on that next street back there, we'll have our second line of resistance. And then even farther back along Princess Anne Street, we'll have our third line of resistance. And if you're wondering where the names of Fredericksburg comes from, this is actually not named after Frederick the Great, like most people think. It's actually named after the son of King George II, his not so loved son, Frederick. Uh, Frederick will die in a freak accident, I think playing uh, tennis. Um, but yeah, okay. it is named after the House of Hanover. So you see Caroline, Princess Anne, George, all of that. So this is actually named after the House of Hanover, who's the ruling house of Great Britain, whenever this is a colonial city founded in 1728. So into this area will come the Michigan troops. They will pour into here, start going into the houses, start clearing out. And some of these are original houses, clearing out the Confederates. On the opposite bank of the river, we will still have Union soldiers watching this is the greatest panorama of the war, according to historian Gary Gallagher. They could see up and down the river. They're watching their friends die out in these boats. They're seeing them fight house by house, street by street. And more men will come across this, this uh, area. That'll be the 19th Massachusetts of Captain Henry uh, Weymouth, under the command of Captain Henry Weymouth. They will move into here and we'll have more Union soldiers fighting into this area. And the Union soldiers don't really have many orders other than to establish this bridgehead. Now, while all this is happening, the engineers go back to work. As they go back to work, they're undercover now because the Confederate infantry aren't picking them off on the bridges. They're focused now on the Michiganders, the Bay State men, and then down in another crossing, some New York men coming across as well, the 89th New York, Harrison Fairchild's uh, 89th New York. But these men will make it up into this area here, into a blind alley. We're walking along Hawk Street here in Fredericksburg. And I'm gonna jump behind the camera for a minute just to give you an idea of where we are uh, and give Chris a, a quick break. And we are walking up through, through this area and they'll come up along a, into a blind alley uh, along Hawk Street as they make their way towards Princess Anne Street. And as they come into this blind alley over here, um, the Michiganders will come to ground and this is where they're gonna stop. Some of the men from Massachusetts will actually go onto the other side of the street. The uh, palm trees were not here at the time, nor was that house. Um, and they will start moving up into some of the backyards over on the other side of the street. And then they will be faced off at this intersection up here. This is the intersection of Princess Anne, I'm sorry, Caroline Street and Hawk Street. This will become the deadliest intersection in Fredericksburg. So at this point, we have more Massachusetts state soldiers coming across here, and that'll be the 20th Massachusetts Infantry. Even though one of the bridges is already complete, the Bloody 20th as they are known, today we call them the Harvard Regiment, they will come across in boats in very flamboyant style, pour out of the boats and march in column right to this point. And standing here will be Cap Acting, Major Cap uh, Acting Major George Macy. He's gonna run into Thomas Hunt, the commander of the 7th Michigan, the two of them are gonna exchange words. And basically, Macy's gonna tell Hunt, hey, get your Michiganders, move them forward, get those Wolverines moving. Hunt's like, no, 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 we're good. We've already established a bridgehead, we're not moving. Macy says, no, we're not moving. So as this impasse is going on, there are Confederates legitimately across the street listening to what's happening. As they're listening to this idiocy, they know that the Federals are gonna attack at some point. Then across the river, they send word for some more orders. They send back to their division commander, a guy named Oliver Otis Howard, the pious but vapid Oliver Otis Howard, probably one of the worst combat leaders in the American Civil War. Brave to a fault, but yeah, I don't want to follow him to water. 
Uh, but, uh, but Howard's eventually going to say something along the lines of push forward. He doesn't tell him where to go, who to go, what to do. And so Macy and Hunt have these orders now. They look at each other. Hunt says, I'm not moving and I outrank you. Macy says, well, I'll go forward and you go, can go to hell with your regiment. And into the intersection will go the 20th Massachusetts. The 20th, as they come up into this intersection, the Mississippians who are in this area already know they're coming. And Company I, who is leading the way, commanded by a, a, a captain named Henry Abbott, who leaves us a fantastic uh, diary and letters of the war, his men will charge straight through the intersection while the rest of the 20th cordons off this area. This is the first urban combat we're seeing here, large scale urban combat in the Eastern Theater. The Union Army and the Confederate Army are not trained for urban combat. They are going to do a lot of different things during the war, fight in open fields. They're gonna to have to do river crossings, but they're not trained for urban combat. We do see urban combat in the Revolutionary War at places like Quebec. Uh, we'll also see it at second, first and second Trenton. We'll see it during the Mexican-American War, and we'll see it in the Civil War, but in the Western theater, places like Cynthia and Carthage, uh, Missouri. We don't see it here in the Eastern theater really on large scale until we see this battle here. You can call the Philippi races a street fight, but it's more of a uh, running battle uh, than anything. But now, the Mississippians, who are thinking outside the box, commanded by 41-year-old uh, William Barksdale, who's not a West Point graduate, has to figure out where the high ground is here in this urban combat sector. What do they do? They get into the second and third stories of these buildings down here. And we have Confederates firing down into this intersection. Within this intersection here of Caroline Street and Hawk Street, 97 of the 20th Massachusetts will fall. One man said that 15 of his comrades were buried in one of the street, one of the corners here, all buried after being killed in this intersection. What happens is the 20th, the first platoon of Company I goes charging straight forward and they go deeper into the city. The rest of the regiment starts to actually wheel to the left, the right and go straight and seal off this intersection. And then men will start to go into the houses. Now you would think the Confederates have a pretty good advantage here because they're inside of the houses. But you'll notice down here, and these are private homes, they're clapboard, many of them. Many balls will rip right through them, as will the artillery shells. Now the artillery shells ripping through them have created new portals for some of these men to fire through. But when the mini balls fire through, splinters will come through. They'll hit the men, they'll be wounded not only by lead, but they can be wounded by glass that's flying out of these windows. They can be wounded by uh, wood coming and hitting men. It's just gonna be a nasty place to be. But eventually, this intersection is sealed off and the first line of resistance has to give way, then the second line of Confederate resistance will give way. Eventually, of the mile and a quarter riverfront down here that the uh, city of Fredericksburg spans, the Union soldiers will take over about 1,110 feet of it and then keep expanding and keep expanding and keep expanding. Chris? Uh, I can't overestimate enough or underestimate enough on just how vital Barksdale's action is. Lee wants him to buy a couple hours. And so once he's able to do that, word comes down from his commander, Lafayette McClaws, to Barksdale to pull back. But McClaws is having such success at delaying the Union crossing that he ignores the order. And he's gonna be able to continue this delaying action over the course of the full day. Why is that important? Well, as Chris mentioned earlier, or as Sarah mentioned earlier, Stonewall Jackson's Corps is stretched 25 miles to the south of here. We only have James Longstreet's Corps occupying the Confederate line at this point. So this is gonna be much needed time that Lee is gonna be able to consolidate his position, except that he doesn't. Lee is still not entirely convinced that this is gonna be Burnside's main effort. He's surprised that Burnside isn't using more strength to get across the river. But Burnside himself is aghast that he can't get across the river. At one point he says, our entire army is being held by the throats by a group of sharpshooters. That's how effective that this delaying uh, effort is. 
Now, it's also important to note that Lee has been completely flummoxed by Burnside up to this point. He allowed the bridges to get halfway across the river before those signal guns went off because that commits the Federals to crossing here. Up to this point, Lee hasn't known where they're going to cross. So once they finally get in invested, they finally get across, Lee's still not quite sure that this is going to be the main crossing. So Bar a Barksdale's delay becomes super important as time continues to go on because Lee's going to then start to figure out how to actually deal with this. This fighting is going to go on throughout the streets here all day long until finally James Longstreet will send a peremptory order through McClaws to Barksdale to pull back to the main line, which from where we're at is almost a thousand yards off to my left along Marie's Heights. And so Barksdale will buy a full day for Lee before he finally pulls out. Pulls out. Now, I also want to go back to another point Chris made about how the fact that the armies have not trained for this. So again, when I mentioned earlier about, you know, the common misperception about Burnside is he's not the sharpest tool in the shed. Look at how much he has had to rewrite the rules of war throughout this engagement. First riverine crossing under fire. First urban combat here for this army. They've never trained for that before. First time we've had to bombard our own city. And so Burnside's making this up as he goes. Final point I want to make here before I ask Chris to come back on is that Burnside didn't want any of this to begin with. He had gotten to the river, he had gotten stalled, he would looked at the options that Dan laid out earlier and he wanted to call a timeout. But because of the Emancipation Proclamation, which is supposed to go into effect on January 1st, Lincoln forces Burnside to do something. And so as the day goes on, as this campaign goes on, he's forced into a funnel of decision making that leads him to worse and worse choices. He's trying to make the best choices he can. He's trying to rewrite the, the rules of war as he goes, uh, but he's finding himself backed into a corner until finally when he gets bogged down into a type of fighting they've never experienced before, he is completely flummoxed. And so as his army floods across and gets this beachhead, establishes its presence in Fredericksburg, Burnside's not going to know what to do. He hasn't thought that far ahead at this point. And so his decision making will continue to get more and more limited. We're going to take a walk through this town here and talk a little bit more about the implications of what's going on. Chris? Burnside not thinking that far ahead. I mean, you could do a hashtag with that one. <laughs> uh, so we're going to uh, cross. This is uh, Caroline Street. This is essentially Main Street here. I'm check checking out some of your comments here. Hey, Darren, joining us from the UK, one of our good friends here. And as you look around here, um, one of the things I like to point out uh, uh, as we come through Fredericksburg is this part of the town. Uh, so if you drive through Fredericksburg, if you've never been here, it's actually a beautiful town. At the time of the war, it has a wartime population of about 5,040 people. We don't know how many people are here during the battle because there was a federal occupation from April until August of 1862. That's the first federal occupation. And some people leave. Specifically, the people who, who uh, leave uh, in great droves are the African Americans in the area. Uh, the enslaved population who are in the area, they self emancipate themselves and they head over to the Union armies. They'll do the same thing during the Fredericksburg campaign. In fact, if you look at a lot of the, the photographs from the time of the winter encampment of 1862 uh, 63, you'll see. Um, pictures of like William Gamble. He's made famous fighting with John Buford at first day at Gettysburg. Um, and he will have a black servant with him as will other Union officers because these are newly emancipated people who are now finding employment with the Union Army. Um, so we estimate there's maybe a thousand people in Fredericksburg during the battle. Now keep in mind when the Union Army arrives here there's almost three weeks between the start of the battle, uh, their arrival and the start of the battle. So some people do come back. There's a large refugee camp we know out at the Salem Church, which is about six miles to the west of us. It's still operated today by the National Park Service. It's a National Park Service unit. It's a really cool site, uh, site of a battle in May of 1863. And then you look around this area and you'll see historic homes. Not all of these are historic up here. And you'll notice that it's very much a colonial city. But if you drive through Fredericksburg, today and you come down Caroline Street, you go up Princess Anne Street, as you start on the south end of the city, and then you go to the middle and end of the north where we are, you'll notice that the south and the north end of the city have houses like this. But the middle part of the city have a lot of homes as well as businesses from the 1930s, 40s, 50s. That's the area of the town that was hit, hit heavily during the bombardment. It will take until the 1950s for this area to economically recover. That's 90 years after the battle for it to economically recover. And not until the 1960s 
does this area get its wartime population back to what it was during the Civil War era? So this area is very much hit by the hard hand of war. And you can follow that right down the I-95 corridor from Fredericksburg to Richmond to Petersburg, where in, even in Petersburg today, you can still see row houses that were destroyed during the war that have never been rebuilt. Looks like Chris has something to say. Yeah, one of the other kind of cool things about the layout too is, uh, you know, we talked about that transportation hub. And so the, the buildings along the river, you had a lot of warehouses. It's a, it's a really industrial area. You come up the next street, you get into the business district where you've got lots of shops and stores. Main Street, as Chris had mentioned earlier. And then you get a street up and you get into the more residential area. So you're kind of getting away from all the work that's down by the river centered around that transportation hub. And so you can still see part of that character of the city today. Uh, it's really neat that you can kind of come tap into those multi-layers of history from the colonial area through the revolution and up through uh, the Civil War area and today. Um, you know, the, the colonial history of this city is just fantastic. Um, John Paul Jones, the, the naval hero, had lived here. Hugh Mercer, one of the early um, uh, martyrs of the revolution was here. Uh, James Monroe practiced law here. George Washington and, and Thomas Jefferson both visited here. So, uh, of course, Washington grew up right across the river. George's mom lived here yeah. for the last 17 years of her life. George's His mom sister's here. here. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, just lots of, lots of great history. So we're going to walk through town here a little bit more and take a look at some of that. So to bring you back to our, our story here, what we now have is this intersection is now sealed off by the 20th Massachusetts, and this is a resistance point. Now we have the uh, Company I, or at least one platoon of it, being led by Henry Abbott charging deeper into the city. Abbott, remember, doesn't really have any specific orders. No one really does, other than to push forward. And that's exactly what he does. So as Abbott pushes deeper into the city, he's going to reach Princess Anne Street. But as he does so, he too is going to find that he is running into basically traps laid by the Confederates. Um, they've cut holes in some of the fences or firing through them. They're going to be um, in basements firing out from, from those areas. In fact, there was, uh, uh, after the, the city is seized by the Federals, um, these Union soldiers go into one of the houses and uh, one of the walls can be completely blown out of it. And an officer comes by and says, hey guys, it wouldn't be a bad idea for you to get out of this house that's about to fall over. And as they all come out of the house, they found almost 30 dead Confederates inside of that house. And they realized just why it was so devastated. It's because it was, a, it was a nest of Confederates, obliterated essentially. And um, this town will be really devastated. But Abbott will make it up to this point. This is Princess Anne Street. Dan's pointing the camera towards the south. Um, I know Chris wants to talk about the Douglas Gordon house here in a moment. Uh, but you're looking actually here in a moment, kind of uphill. And I know we're looking into the sun. This is the tough part of shooting this time of day. But if you're, you're looking uphill there, and what you're looking at is the high ground. Fredericksburg actually sits on a plateau. And William Barksdale's headquarters is just about a quarter mile to the south of us at a place called the Market House. It was uh, built in 1816, and it was where they had the market. Today, it's the Fredericksburg Area Museum. Great museum. Feel free to stop by there if you're ever in Fredericksburg. But Barksdale will establish his headquarters there in the center of the city on the third line of his resistance. So he is able to send men to the north and to the south. To the north, he'll send Floridians into the south because he has some flexibility. But ironically, states uh, rivalry get in the way. And these poor Floridians aren't given any room in the city to fight. They're actually on the outskirts of the city in open land. And in fact, the Floridians are in such a poor position to the south of us, uh, Captain William Baya refuses to fire on the Federals. And you know why? Because he found out if you fire at the Federals, they'll fire back at you. And so Baya just sits there and the Mississippians are screaming at him, fire, fire, fire. And they're like, no, 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 you guys have the houses and warehouses. We're in an open field. We're not doing that. So eventually Baya and some of his men are cut off. To the north of the town, the Floridians are also in a bad place. And their captain, David Lang, he is actually going to be hit by some rubble from a falling chimney where he was standing nearby. And about half of his company takes him and runs off to the rear. So the fastest way to get off the field is to take your wounded uh, officer with you. But Abbott, as he comes up here from the 20th Massachusetts, will actually turn down this road and go up towards that high ground, that little plateau, where he runs into his Harvard roommate. A man named Lane Brandon and when he arrives at that point they don't know it really but they're facing off against each other old roommates old rivalries coming here to a head 
at Fredericksburg. Later on, the two will figure out that they actually fought against each other because they send letters between uh, each other, I think, between his aunt, uh, between Lane Bryan's aunt. Brandon refuses to pull off the line here, in fact. Three times they have to send orders to him, and eventually they say, we will court-martial you and arrest you if you don't take your men off the field because he didn't want to give up the fight here. And that's the fight here of the Mississippians. Barksdale will hold this city for an entire day. And Barksdale will have to wait until darkness. As Chris mentioned, there's a 1,000 yards of open fields leaning out towards Maurice Heights, which we'll see later on today if you join us for later on um, in, in our coverage. But down in this area... What we're seeing here are the Federals rewriting or writing their own manual of how to fight into the city, and the Confederates doing the same thing. They're improvising. Eventually, the city will be seized around darkness on the evening of December the 11th. And this throws off Burnside's entire timetable. Burnside wanted to move across his army on the 11th, make assaults on the 12th. Now he has to move across on the 12th and make assaults on the 13th. And in the meantime, the city itself will be sacked by the Federals. The Federals will lay waste to Fredericksburg. Some of the Federals will try to save it. There will actually be fires here in Fredericksburg, and some of the Philadelphia volunteer firefighters, uh, who were firefighters before the war, uh, specifically from Joshua Owens' brigade, the same ones who defend the stone wall at Gettysburg on July 3rd, 1863, they will try to put out some of the fires. While well, other men will go into houses. They'll steal alligators. They'll steal wedding dresses. They're going to bring pianos out into the, into the road and start to play it. And you have to think to yourself, this is horrible that they're doing this to a, to a city. But if you put yourself in the shoes of the, the federal soldiers for a moment, and this isn't justifying what they're doing, but think about them for one moment. They had been within six miles of Richmond earlier in the year. Then they had been pushed back to the gates of Washington. They had had victory ripped from their grasp time and again on the peninsula. They won at Antietam, but then don't follow up that victory. And now here on December the 13th, they've watched their friends come across this river and the greatest panoramic of the war and watched them be shot down by these Confederates. They've unleashed their wrath of the last six months on the city of Fredericksburg. One man will call it the most goth of goths. So it's a terrible uh, thing that happens to the people here in Fredericksburg. And in fact, relief foundations will be found in the north and the south to try to rebuild Fredericksburg in the midst of the war. And... Marcina Patrick, the provost marshal, is absolutely beside himself as he's trying to put a damper on all that looting. It's one of the darkest chapters in the history of the American army. Um, and even as he goes from cluster of soldiers to cluster of soldiers, they'll stop as long as he's there. And as soon as he leaves, the looting begins again. The officers do nothing to try to stop what their men are doing. They share that frustration. They've seen how hard it was to get across this river. They've seen men fall. They are ready for revenge. And unfortunately, they take it out on this city. Now imagine if you're one of those 1,000 civilians that's still here and how horrific that experience must be as you're seeing your town get looted and burned around you. Uh, so it's absolute pandemonium. In the meantime, Burnside actually comes across the river to try to figure out what he's going to do. Like as I mentioned earlier, he hasn't really thought ahead. He figured he'd get across the river and it would scare Robert E. Lee out of his position. And then, then he'd start moving south. And then, of course, Robert E. Lee's still there. And so he's not sure what to do. Should he cross his whole army overnight? Should he wait until the morning? How should he attack? What should he do? He's completely flummoxed, and so he'll waste a precious time. So all that time that Barksdale bought then gets compounded by a whole bunch of time that Burnside is going to waste, the night of the 11th into the 12th, as Burnside tries to figure out what to do. One of the officers that makes his headquarters across on this side of the river is uh, the vapid but pious Oliver Otis Howard, who will make his headquarters here in the Douglas House. This house is first actually occupied by Alfred Sully, one of the brigadiers. Um, he occupies the house because it belongs to his brother-in-law. It is an opulent mansion full of beautiful, beautiful paintings, a massive library. There's actually a whole series of very expensive mirrors in there. And Sully places a guard there so that nobody ruins his brother-in-law's house. In fact, many of the paintings that are in there were painted by Sully's father himself, including a painting of Sully himself when Sully was three or four years old. 
So because the house is not destroyed, when Howard finally comes across the river to get the lay of the land, he takes over and uses his headquarters. The house also happens to be full of a lot of provisions. Uh, the drawing room in particular is full of lots of sugar, flour, uh, baking goods, and a lot of other supplies like that. Someone somewhere <laughs> decides to bake Oliver Otis Howard a pie. And then someone leaves it on the windowsill to cool off. And lo and behold, some enterprising young soldier snatches Howard's pie. Um, and I guess since he only has uh, one arm, he can't grab a hold of it to save it from its escape. So um, that's a little bit of a, one of those human interest stories here and why the Gordon House does survive in a neighborhood that otherwise gets a lot of abuse. Sarah? Thanks, Chris. I wanted to jump on, and that's a perfect segue because I had a couple of human interest stories. Um, we've been talking about the plundering, the destruction that happened here in Fredericksburg. And I came across a couple stories um, that would have happened in this area. So one comes from an officer in the 19th Massachusetts, and he says that some of his men went into a house and um, they found a barrel of molasses and they decided to fill their canteens with molasses. And when I was reading that, I had to stop and think about how sticky molasses is. I like to bake um, and molasses, it seems like every time I use it, it gets everywhere. And that's exactly what it says in this officer's writing. He says that that entire house got covered in molasses. And then I was thinking about those sticky canteens as the soldiers head out into battle in the coming days. Um, there's other stories about, um, as Chris said, provisions getting taken and um, soldiers are looking for food. They're looking for that revenge as has been talked about. And sometimes they're just kind of looking for souvenirs. Um, in the last few minutes, you've heard Henry Abbott's name, officer in the 20th uh, Massachusetts mentioned several times. And he's a rather upstanding citizen on most days, but when he's here in Fredericksburg, he goes souvenir hunting. He's looking for specific things to send back to his mother and his siblings back home. And he's disappointed, if I remember correctly, that he doesn't find silver things like silver hairbrushes, but he takes books. He likes to read. So he steals some books from Fredericksburg. So these are the type of things that are happening. Sometimes scenes of intense anger and in this destruction. Other times it's almost more curiosity that's happening. There's a lot of human interest stories that happen um, once Fredericksburg has been taken over by the Union soldiers and in that period before we get to the next part of the fighting. Yeah, I was surprised that Chris didn't point out, you know, one of the brothels that were down here because I know that's always on his mind. Um, but one of the places across the street might have been one of the, the wartime era brothels, allegedly, allegedly. Um, and, and with that, Sarah, I just want to uh, add a couple things that, that items do actually arrive back in Fredericksburg. There are soldiers, uh, I'm glad you brought up, they're, they're picking through things. And Marcina Patrick, the provost marshal, the military police, is going to say something along the lines of this army is a rabble when it's here. Um, he's also known as the greatest living fossil of the Cenozoic era, uh, according to some other officers. But Patrick will come down here and start or, or try to stop this sacking of the city. And, and after the war, um, you know, things will start to arrive back here um, where people will start to send things back and, you know, kind of feel bad for 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 taking what they did. So uh, some things do make their way back here to Fredericksburg. But um, in in the end, the city of Fredericksburg is taken by the Federals. Let's bring it back to uh, our overarching story. We have about 30,000 Federals that will eventually end up in this city that is meant to hold about 5,000 people today. Uh, the war, the, today's population of Fredericksburg is about 27,000 people. So there's even more people at the time of the war coming across just in the Union Army than there were here, are here today. To the south of us, at our next stop where we're going to head down to, to the south end of the field, we have 60,000 federal soldiers move across. Uh, so we have 90,000 federals moving across six bridges. And it took the fighting here in the city to establish those, those bridgeheads. The Confederates, now that they start to see those 90,000 federal soldiers starting to move across, that convinces Robert E. Lee that the battle will indeed be here at Fredericksburg. And that will set up the uh, Battle of Fredericksburg that most people know that happened on December 13th. The December 11th fighting, it's very much overlooked. But in the roughly six hours of fighting that took place down in this area, there were about 660 casualties. Uh, about 330 of them will come from the uh, 20th Massachusetts, as well as Hall's Brigade, about 49 of them will come from the 50th New York Engineers. And then the Barksdale's men will lose about 240-ish men. That's in less than a day's fighting. 
To put that in perspective, the Second Battle of Fallujah, which took place over six weeks and saw intense U.S. urban combat, we sustained about that number of casualties in six weeks. So to show you the intensity of the fighting down here in just a matter of hours versus six weeks in modern warfare, it was really an intense battle, one-on-one, -on -one, literally some men on one side of a house on the other side of the house taking one another out. It was a brutal place to be. And then that is going to lead into our December 12th and then, of course, our 13th action. So on behalf of the American Battlefield Trust, I'm Chris White. I want to thank Chris Mikowski, Dan Davis, Sarah Byerly. We're going to bring you more coverage here of Fredericksburg for the 160th anniversary. We hope on YouTube you'll click that subscribe and bell notification. And over on Facebook, we hope that you'll like this video, share it with your friends, with your family. And we hope that you'll check out everything we have over at battlefields.org. We have membership options. We have free videos, lesson plans for teachers. We also have a field trip fund, all kinds of different things, all funded by the members of the American Battlefield Trust. So on behalf of the members of the trust, I'm Chris White. Thank you for watching. Thank you for supporting Battlefield Preservation and Education.